Hello and welcome. I decided to make a short video series on uncertainty quantification in deep learning. A couple of years ago, I participated in a Kaggle competition with medical image data. And the special thing about it was that the predictions needed to include a confidence score. Until this point, I had never before used uncertainty approaches in deep learning, and I did some research, which is compressed in those videos. Actually, many end users of machine learning systems request confidence scores, and therefore I think it's very useful to know some basics. So after this series, you will be familiar with six ways how to measure confidence in deep neural networks, and there will be two illustrative videos and two hands-on videos. Most of the following is based on two papers which are linked in the video description. Finally, I wanted to mention that you can approach uncertainty quantification from a very theoretical point of view, but I try to keep it as practical as possible here. Before we dive deeper into the topic, let's first have a look at some useful applications. I mean, why should we even bother with uncertainty if our model produces good predictions? Of course, we need to rely on the predictions, especially in safety critical fields like medicine, just like with the Kaggle example I mentioned previously. Whenever there are humans involved, we can report the confidence metrics to signal how trustworthy a prediction is. It can also be helpful in autonomous systems to test how reliable the model is in certain situations. This also motivates the use for active learning by selecting low confidence samples to further improve the model. But it can not only be useful to detect the right samples, but also invalid ones. Uncertainty quantification is, for example, used to detect adversarial or out-of-distribution samples. You might even use uncertainty-powered models in your daily life. The voice assistant Siri is based on a neural net that calculates a confidence score to filter out the terms Hey Siri. And Google's weather forecasting model also incorporates uncertainties in the predictions. These are just a few examples, and as I mentioned before, in my opinion, it can be quite useful in many scenarios. The literature distinguishes between two types of uncertainty in machine learning. This might seem unnecessary at first, but actually it's very useful to differentiate between those two. Throughout the series we will learn why. The first one is aleatoric uncertainty, which comes from the Latin word alia that refers to the randomness in a dice game. It's simply the statistical uncertainty in the data, and it mainly comes from feature overlaps and noise that make it impossible to give a certain answer. Some more examples are measurement errors, false labeling, or also limited information about the real world. The second type is epistemic uncertainty, which comes from the Greek word epistemikos and means as much as the uncertainty in knowledge. In a deep learning context, it therefore refers to the uncertainty in the model, because our model represents our knowledge about a problem. Epistemic uncertainty is typically the only uncertainty we can reduce by building a better model. This includes tuning hyperparameters, using better trained test distributions, or using more data. If we have an optimal model, the epistemic uncertainty is theoretically zero. Okay, now how does it help us if we distinguish between those two? For this I've created a simple regression example that might help to explain it. Let's say we want to sell ice cream and use the temperature of the day as predictor of how many scoops we sell. The historical data we recorded is shown in the scatter plot. We obtain this more or less linear relationship, the hotter the weather is, the more ice cream we sell. If the temperature is low, we have a very little spread given the feature x1, and whenever the temperature is high, the spread of our y values gets bigger. That's because on hot days people either stay at home because it's too hot, or enjoy the warm sun and buy a lot of ice cream. But we can certainly say that not many people buy ice cream when it's cold. We also have a model, for example a neural network, with some parameters called theta. Intuitively, our model should now give us a high confidence for low values of x1 and a low confidence, which means a high uncertainty, for high values of x1. This can be visualized as confidence bands, which you might be familiar with from statistics. This uncertainty is exactly the aleatoric uncertainty. It's the uncertainty in the data that can be learned by our model. But no matter how much data we give the model, we can never reduce this uncertainty, because it's caused by the underlying data generation process. 
In this example, the main reason for aleatoric uncertainty is that we have only a single feature and quite some noise in our data. The important point now is that these uncertainty estimates are only reliable as long as we stay inside our training distribution. In this one-dimensional example, we have x1 values in this range. We have, however, never seen data outside of this range and therefore our uncertainty should be very high in this region. For example, we don't know what happens if we have a very, very high or very low temperature. Those are classical out-of-distribution samples. But because the model has learned the aleatoric uncertainty based on the training distribution, we cannot trust it outside of this region. Now, what about epistemic uncertainty? A model like a neural network inherently carries uncertainty. That's because a specific choice of parameters theta might not be optimal. This can simply happen because the model might not have seen enough data yet or the hyperparameters are not perfect. The twist here is, even if we predict uncertainty in the data, we can still be uncertain about this prediction. This uncertainty based on the model parameters is the epistemic uncertainty. The good part is that it is reducible, for example by finding better weights in the model, using more data or doing a hyperparameter search. In order to estimate the uncertainty in the predictions, typically a probability distribution over the parameters is formed, but this depends on the method that is used. Instead of having a deterministic model that always produces the same output, we have some variation in the predictions. This way we can provide an estimate of the confidence of our model. If the distribution is peaked, we can be more certain about the outputs of the neural network, and if it's flat, it means that the model is not very confident. But we will see more details around this later in the video series. In our example, we can visualize a confident model with predictions that are very similar for a given input and an uncertain model, for example, outside of our training distributions with predictions that are very spread. Now let's finally have a look at some methods for handling uncertainty. We will start with aleatoric uncertainty in this video and the next part is all about epistemic uncertainty and some other possibilities. The following methods are approaches to capture the variation in the data, but not in the model. One of the easiest ways to get a simple uncertainty measurement are maximum likelihood estimation approaches. To express it in simple words, we just learn the parameters of a conditional probability distribution and use this distribution to quantify the uncertainty. We will first look at the regression case and afterwards at classification. This is our standard neural net. It receives some input x and outputs a prediction y. Without thinking about it, we already did some sort of parameter estimation here. Assuming that our label is normally distributed, we can say that our prediction is nothing else but the mean of this underlying distribution. This means we output a point estimate and assume a fixed variance for each sample. Now, instead of only predicting the mean, we could also try to predict more parameters of this distribution. The Gaussian normal distribution can be expressed by this formula. As you can see, there are two highlighted parameters that define the distribution, which are the mean mu and the standard deviation sigma, which is the square root of the variance. Depending on those, the distribution will have a different shape. When we only predict a point estimate, the blue terms are constant and with some additional reformulations, we end up with nothing else but the mean squared error. Okay, so let's quickly change this network to predict the mean and standard deviation. Our prediction is not a single point estimate anymore, but instead a conditional distribution over y defined by the predicted parameters. And this eventually gives us an estimate on the uncertainty in form of the variance around the mean. How do you optimize this thing given the fact that we don't know the real mu and sigma of the underlying distribution? This brings us to maximum likelihood estimation. The choice of mu and sigma is based on the likelihood of observing the true label for the distribution defined by mu and sigma. In other terms, we learn to predict a distribution that best fits our observations. The loss function in such a scenario is the negative log likelihood. Let's have a closer look at this expression. The likelihood in this term can simply be calculated by plugging in the predicted parameters into the normal distribution. 
In fact, you can see it as a variant of the mean squared error that additionally considers uncertainty. The middle part in this formula is the well-known MSC, which is multiplied with one divided by the variance. Now, if the variance is very small, the model should better provide a good prediction, so a small error, as otherwise the loss will be very high. If the variance is high, however, which allows the model to mitigate this first loss term, the second term penalizes it. Therefore, it's a sort of trade-off. For a derivation of this expression, please have a look at the link in the description. Because we typically solve minimization problems with neural nets, the whole term is negative, and finally, the log helps to ensure better convergence. The goal of this optimization problem is to find the network parameters theta, so the weights of our neural network, that provide the mean and standard deviation that leads to the highest likelihood. So one set of weights might predict this distribution, and some other weights lead to those. And the highest likelihood of observing this red y value has certainly the distribution in the middle. And that's basically all we need. In our previous ice cream example, the predictions highlighted in red are now not simply points anymore, but instead distributions over y. And those distributions are based on the underlying data uncertainty. In the next part, I will show you a Google Colab notebook with an implementation of exactly that and also all other methods I mentioned here. Let's also quickly have a look at the classification case, which is quite similar. When we apply softmax in the final layer of a classification network, we automatically end up with a probability distribution. Instead of the normal distribution we had for regression, we have a categorical distribution here. And the parameters that define this distribution are the predicted class probabilities of each class. Similarly as before, we can also maximize the likelihood, which is done by minimizing the cross entropy. Further details can again be found in the video description. As you might know, the softmax makes the output probability sum up to 1. For example, 0.9 for one class and 0.1 for the other. Can we interpret these outputs as uncertainty estimation? Well, there are a few problems with this. First of all, we can only trust the values if the input comes from the same distribution as the train data. For example, the model was trained on these brain scans and we input something different like this lung scan. We would expect very low class probabilities for whatever classification problem we have, but the issue is that the softmax forces the model to provide predictions that sum up to one. So just like in the regression case, we cannot really capture out of distribution data. Another problem was nicely visualized in a blog post from Tucker Kirvin. It turns out that models tend to be overconfident with the predicted probabilities. This means the models more often predict values close to 1 or 0 and less often values around 0.5. And this in the end means that the model is not really able to express uncertainty as it thinks that it's most of the time very confident. In the literature, you can also find some approaches to get more reliable predicted probabilities. One of them is temperature scaling, which is a technique that rescales the outputs of the model before applying softmax. Besides that, there are many other extensions which I can't capture all in this video series. To wrap this up, we can use the predicted class probabilities as some sort of uncertainty measure, but should be aware that the predictions are usually overconfident and will also not work on out-of-distribution samples. In the regression case, a simple extension of predicting a normal distribution is to predict several normal distributions. This allows the model to build a mixture of Gaussians that can form a more general function. These so-called mixture density models were published in 1994 by Christopher Bishop. The output of our network are now multiple parameters of these distributions. The distributions are then combined according to mixing coefficients that are also learned by the model. The result is a more general distribution over our target variable, and this can again be optimized using the maximum likelihood approach. In the hands-on part, I will share some more details around mixture density models. A third approach to estimate aleatoric uncertainty is called quantile regression. 
Previously, we were dealing with a lot of Gaussian distributions, but what if we simply don't want to make any assumption on how our target variable is distributed? This, however, means we cannot simply specify a likelihood. For this, quantile regression allows us to estimate the quantiles of any distribution in form of a lower and upper bound. Quantiles can be used to divide a probability distribution. For example, the 25% quantile has 25% of the values on the left and 75 on the right. The median splits a distribution exactly in the middle and the 75% quantile is exactly the other way around. If we are able to estimate those quantiles, like the 25 and 75% ones, we can provide an uncertainty score that tells us how spread the output distribution is. Previously, we could use the likelihood to learn such estimates, but what do we do now as we don't know the underlying distribution? To estimate quantiles, we can use the pinball loss function. The name of this loss function comes from its shape, which reminds of the trajectory of a pinball. This loss function has a parameter called tau that allows us to estimate a specific quantile. The loss is zero if exactly the quantile is predicted and its increase is asymmetric around this point to force the model to fulfill the quantile conditions. When we set tau to 0.5, it corresponds to estimating the median of the distribution. In fact, the loss function is then nothing else but the mean absolute error. In the following, we will choose 10%, 50% and 90%. We can make our model predict three outputs for this. The intuition behind this loss is to penalize over or under predicting for each of the predicted quantiles. The true label is denoted with yt here and the prediction of one of the three model outputs is yp. Let's have a look at the first output neuron of our model. The parameter tau in the loss function is set to 0.1 here. When choosing a low quantile like 10%, we expect most of the outputs to be smaller than the real label. Let's say the true output is 1.5 and the predicted outputs for the 0.1 quantile is 0.5. Then the first line of this loss term is true and we only have a very small loss because it's multiplied with 0.1. On the other hand, if the prediction is much higher, such as 2.5 here, then the second line is true and we will receive a much higher loss value. So this loss function forces the model to place the predictions in areas where these quantile conditions are true. And this eventually gives us some intervals we can use to estimate the uncertainty. Just like with the other methods, we will see an implementation of this in the next video. Congratulations, you have finished the first part of this video series capturing aleatoric uncertainty. We talked about maximum likelihood estimation, mixture density models and quantile regression. Now this was probably a lot of information and I think it might be useful to come back after reading some more literature on this topic. In the video after the hands-on session, we will see how we can estimate the epistemic uncertainty in the model. That's all for today, see you soon in the next part.